the things I've noticed about your your time and efforts recently, like a lot of it's in strenuous physical activity. I mean, yeah, I'm kind of curious. A lot of demons when, to exercise. Has that accelerated during this time period, or where um, did where did that? When you did know, you need to this is a great scratch is, that itch. It's a great. I love that you asked that question. It's a great question. You know, in the beginning of my career, there was four burners. I'm not sure if you've heard this analogy, but it's a really beautiful analogy, and I really hope people listen to this. But there's four burners in your career you know, and in your life, right? There's your family, there's your health, there's your work, and there's your friends. And in the beginning of my career, I, I turned off. You have to turn off one to be successful. And in order to be really successful, you have to turn off two or turn them down to a low simmer. And I did that. I turned off the health burner. I turned off the friendship burner and I got married at 21. So my wife kind of became part of my family. And that was this, it was work and family. And that was it. That was it. And I, I burnt a lot of bridges and I, I, I actually, and what I mean by that is like I burnt a lot of friendships that just didn't I, didn't, I didn't nurture them. I didn't give time to them. I didn't hang out with people. I didn't do that. And also health, it was like I'd sit at the computer and edit till 2.30 in the morning and then get up and grab donuts and drive up the coast and shoot photos. So work was everything to me and it was unhealthy. And I think at a certain point, again, you, you realize I've spent the last decade chasing around professional athletes while they pursue their dreams and like, what are my dreams? What, what am I giving to myself? What am I giving, what time am I giving to myself to, to sort of see what I'm capable of? Have there been any truths that have become apparent to you that you're like, oh, I didn't, I never yeah, considered that? Yeah, I think in some ways, like, in, like many other people, I kind of sold myself this lie that I had to travel to make, make a living and it, it, it's easier, yes, it is easier. It's, something I do have to do. Like, um, it's just the way I've built my business. If I could work every day in San Luis Obispo County and, and make it be awesome, but it's not what I'm sought after for. And, and I realized that through this year, um, that maybe that's not as much of a need. Maybe, maybe a lot of my value, a lot of my self-worth comes from being able to spend time doing the things that I want to do and the time at home. And, and I guess in, in some way, if there's been a revelation, it's just been the idea that um, spending my time to kind of teach and educate and do a workshop for fellow photographers can be equally as, as um, lucrative and, and val valuable for me emotionally, physically, spiritually, and for them as could like going out somewhere else in the world and working on a film or working on an assignment or something like that. If there's one analogy that I've always liked to use, it's like when, you know, when I'm home, it's like there's this big well where all of our water is pulled from, right? And that's, that's me, right? And I'm just filling up that well, filling up that well with things I enjoy, people I love, things I care about, emotional, you know, stability, all these things, health, wellness, whatever. And then when I go out on the road or an assignment, you're like depleting that. You're giving everything to everyone or, or the craft or the art form or the creativity. So I think just realizing that this is a season um, of being able to kind of give back to oneself and feel fulfilled in the things that we're pursuing and the things that we're doing. And that's, and that's been really eye-opening for me in many ways. Do you think or how do you think that art and photography and creativity can make a social impact? Because I think that that has been one of the things that so many creatives have been asking themselves over this. Such a great question, yeah. I, I think this is such an important topic and, and at risk of offending people out there, which probably this probably will, I, I don't think we have the capacity nor the desire deep down nor the ability to care about everything that everybody's shouting about. Human beings were never built to intake this much information. Our phones are, you know, it's a library. You can never read all the books there. You can never gather all the information there. But nowadays we, we somehow find ourselves in a situation where we feel responsible to, to listen to every call and to hear every issue. And I, and I get it. Fires are burning in Australia and this is happening here and the United States is, you know, falling apart and yada yada, all these things are happening. Does that mean you need to just like raise your voice and raise your hand and raise your flag everywhere you go? I don't think so. I think that if you have something you care about deeply, intimately, and you dedicate your time to that and see it through, see real change through, not just like, I'm just gonna start writing checks to this person, this person, this person, and I'm trying to put band-aids on open wounds, right? So for me, what does that look like? What does that mean? How do I actually translate this, what I'm saying into action? Well, I've, I've tried to realize like, 
yes, there's a lot of crap going on in the world, in my own backyard actually, and in the US or wherever, but sometimes it doesn't feel like those things I can change immediately. Yeah, I can give my time and I can dedicate energy and I can give money and speak on it, but maybe I'm sensitive to this because I hear it every day. Chris, you should share this. You know, it just slips into my DMs or in comments and what ends up happening is our attention, at least the attention of those who are kind of online, just, just, it just sways. It's like kids playing soccer, you know, and you see the ball go around the field and all the kids are in a swarm as opposed to holding their positions. So I'm holding my position. I'm saying, this is what I care about. I care about fatherhood because it affects me because I'm a dad and I have these, these, these issues or issues I relate to. So I'm going to make a film about that or I'm going to make a project about that. I care about small rural communities like the one that we made a film about in Japan and, and, and supporting those rural communities and going to on trips as a tourist knowing that my dollars can support these places and maybe opting to not go to, to a mega city or a mega resort but go somewhere where people really care and you can foster real relationships. I care about making books or films that, that hopefully touch on um, cultural and, and significant things that I feel connected to and that's really where I think each project I'm doing, obviously there's commercial stuff I have to do to pay the bills and, but when I'm working on a personal project and I'm investing my time and I'm getting brands to support something, I want it to, I want it to adhere to one of those pillars of what I feel like is important and, and the thing is, I mean, it's an age-old saying, but if you, if you spread yourself too thin and if you, if, you, you know, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. It's a function almost of editing um, and understanding what's most important to you and taking steps in that direction, which, right, which I think in this past, this nine, 12 month span has become maybe more, for some people more confusing and for some people more clarifying. Than yeah, ever. it's super confusing and the idea that like, you know, the idea that you should have something to say about a social justice system that's totally broken and, and, and race issues. I mean, like, I, I'm not that educated. I just don't understand. I need to learn. It might take me months, maybe a year. Considering somebody who's lived with this their whole life and then you, 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 take, it to the, you take it to the realm of influencers who maybe should be saying something and they just don't have anything to say, like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay forcing someone to care or to understand deeply and intimately something that you care about because it's, it's top of mind isn't fair. And I think in many ways what I would urge people to is to find something they do care about and, and stand their ground and, and fight for it and, and voice your opinion and be, um, be a champion of those wild places or people or, or the voiceless or whatever you want to call it, right? I think just understanding that if we're just kind of turning our heads back and forth, eventually you're, you're going to get an X-frame. Do you think that there's some truth to the idea that the best work comes from suffering in some sense, even, even if it's like self-imposed to some yeah, degree? I, I, you like, know, it's, it's so funny because it's a great, you're, you're spot on. Like, so what I, I would, I would phrase this in a different way because I'm, I'm not a masochist. Like I don't enjoy like hurting myself or, or suffering. I, I mean, I even hate that word, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that when you do suffer for something you love, like passion just means suffering. That's what it means. So the difference between passion and inspiration is that passion is something you're willing to suffer for. And when you're willing to give yourself to something, you're willing to sacrifice. I mean, and suffering could be time, be time away from family. It could be a good meal. You're suffering because you're eating some crappy, you know, I don't know, street food and you're not, you know, who knows what that's, you're, you're suffering because you're getting a lack of sleep. Like these don't, you're not like cutting yourself. I'm not talking about like, Deep set. We're talking about opportunities where you're, you're extracting or removing the niceties of your daily life. So when you find that project that you're willing to be passionate about, you're willing to stay up all night to search for the Northern Lights and document. You're willing to stay up and study and, and re read notes and, and redo voiceovers because you want the best possible line. I mean, those are the projects that are worthwhile because you gave a piece of yourself to them. And by giving a piece of yourself to them, you feel intrinsically connected to the experience you feel more emotional, you feel more deeply, you, you feel, you just feel. And that's the whole point. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone through life clicking the shutter of my camera feeling nothing because I wasn't satisfying what was meaningful to me. I was satisfying what was meaningful to my editors or some client or whatever it is. So being able to have both, again, external, external validation, internal validation, 
being able to kind of work on commercial projects and, and personal projects, ones that kind of feed your soul versus ones that kind of feed your mouth or the bank account or whatever that is, it's important to find time for both. And if you're not, you're probably going to leave yourself pretty dissatisfied. And so I think that to answer your question, you know, the suffering is, is critical for growth. And I, I, I just can't see any other way around it. You mm -hmm. know, that's just the way I operate. In that kind of pie chart of your time investments and in like in allocations of yeah, the you know, themes, you know, where, where does innovation and creativity fit into it? Like where is that? Yeah, it's a good question. So innovation and creativity, I think are, they're sort of the, the, the groundwork, right? Like you, you lay down that groundwork of creativity and that's what hopefully fuels everything you do. You put out the work that you want to bring back in. You know, like that's the thing is like I shoot a lot of stuff that I don't really care for people to see because I'm not proud of it. But then the work that I am proud of, I put it out there as long as I can because I want people to know like this is what I can do when given the full length of the leash, when given the full length of creativity. And when I am like I could go to a company like Billabong and I could work on a, a commercial assignment, shooting a catalog, delivering X, delivering Y, but also something meaningful that could go into a film festival and that could tell a deeper story. So therefore, two birds, one stone, right? That's, that's, that, that's kind of the point. And then when it comes to innovation, I think the point with that is just being a student of technology, being a student of what's happening in the world. Innovation is kind of the study of, I think, innovative ideas, new forms of thought. So how do we do that? Well, you have to kind of keep your finger on the pulse in some way. You have to kind of be aware. I, I don't think there's a groundwork there. If creativity is the groundwork, the foundation, the base, and that's like your 10,000 hours, you have to put in the time. There's no overnight success when it comes to creative stories. You put in that and then your work is in the middle, right? And then we're making like a sandwich here. And then the innovation is at the top, right? And that's where every project I do, I'm looking for what's an innovative way for me to tell this story. When I made the film Unner, we were kind of thinking about a couple things. We innovated in a couple ways. We, we used anamorphic lenses, which aren't innovative, they're old school, but they brought a really beautiful perspective. So it was, it was refreshing in that form. We used um, the Sony Rialto camera on the Venice, which was this really beautiful 6K camera that has this moving sensor. So it allowed us to get a lot of these shots that you could have not otherwise gotten had the technology been there. When I made Under Arctic Sky, the innovation was the, the A7S II, which allowed us to shoot at 25,000 ISO in pure darkness, right? These innovative ideas allowed the creativity to blossom, right? So again, we're getting really weird here, but I'm gonna try to do this like, so you have, you have your innovation, these are the clouds, right? And then your, your foundation is the creativity and you're watering this and something's growing, right? So that's kind of how it works. So how, how would you, might you suggest, you know, folks watching who have so much respect for how you've, you've brought, you know, your creative eye and talents and business acumen to the table to, to apply creativity and or innovation into their lives in a way that feels fulfilling and fruitful? Yeah, you know, I think that, again, to echo what you said, experimentation is everything. You gotta be willing to experiment, first of all. In order to experiment, you have to feel like you're in a safe place. You really do. Like, I didn't, I'm not an overnight success at all. If, if I was, it was 13 years of nights, right? I. I prided myself in the beginning of my career on just trying to like shoot anything to make a living. I just wanted to be a photographer. I didn't care if I was shooting weddings or senior pictures. I just got by with what I had. And then once I built up that safety net of, of a little bit of income, I could experiment more and experiment more. What I would urge people to say is if you think of life or opportunity more so like a train station and the train is coming and you're sitting there at the train station, your bags aren't packed and you're trying to shove everything in your bag and you're looking at the train and it's leaving and you're shoving your bags and you're like, I'm gonna have to either leave this bag here and jump on that train, or I'm just gonna ha or I'm gonna miss it. And oftentimes we're like, no, it's cool, I'll, I'll catch it the next one. And you, you keep packing your bags and you run down and you try to catch the next one. It's constantly out of reach, right? Opportunities are like that. They're, they're coming at you whether you're prepared or not. And so I think in some way being willing to take that risk, even if you're not fully prepared, this is kind of my way of saying fake it till you make it, you know? Like, because you just have to try. And if you don't try, you'll, you'll never know, or you'll be constantly chasing this opportunity that, that might not ever come again. There's a, a Sun Tzu quote, opportunities multiply as they're seized. And I mm. think that that's, yeah. there's a truth to that. Yeah, I agree, that's a great quote, love that. Fake it till you make it would be an interesting uh, interpretation of that, but- Fake it till of, you make it's kind of like, it's like here, you know, but like, <laughs> that's just like the, 
but but I think the explanation of like yeah. you know because we can all feel that feeling of like being late and we have to go and yeah and like not being fully ready and it just I I've I can relate to that so many times in my life and I'm just like I'm gonna go for it even if I'm not totally dialed I'm still gonna try and go for it and prove myself and even if I don't have all my ducks in a row and that's it's really it's fake you're faking it you're not totally prepared. It's kind of like the founders dilemma or just an entrepreneurial mindset generally it's like can you do this and the answer is yes I can figure out how to do this. Well, well, like, well think about mostly. it it's like it's like I mean I don't want to get all like you know metaphorical here but like is it really impressive if something grows under perfect perfect conditions or is it more impressive if something blossoms or grows under harsh conditions when everything isn't perfect and what history has taught us what the world has taught us whether it's real or metaphysical is that those things that do grow or blossom during those harsher climates they bear the best fruit they they withstand the strongest storms they have stronger roots right and we don't need to go into all these like household kind of like quotes but that's the truth it's the reality so the stress test of what you put yourself through and your career through is really really important what's well, interesting too because if you say if you answer the question yes can you do this like i can figure it out yeah. and then you either succeed like in real time yeah or you f or you don't yeah and in that process you learn yeah and that still it may be a setback and that might there may be some consequences as yeah. a result of that, but it's going to get you closer to yeah, where you intended is. to be. Yeah, it is. It is, and as long as it doesn't hurt or damage or ruin, really, like, then, then I think go for it, right? And yeah. I think that's the reality. Is like you need a, the, 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 the stress test you need to take, the times that you need to like work, like do it to yourself first before you do it to anybody else. Like, you know, take opportunities that you see coming and that you're willing to like submit time to and give time to and before you go and spend somebody else's money or waste somebody else's time. Right. I think a question I'd like to ask everybody, the, the key to happiness, according huh. to Chris Burkhardt. The key to happiness, geez, that's a heavy one. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what I would say to that. Um, I think the key to happiness is, um, is uh, really just finding out what brings you joy and giving everything you have to that. And that's, that's, that's my key to happiness. And I think that with that, you know, I, I can't really explain what other people's key to happiness would be, what it would look like. Is it, is, it, um, is it family? Is it career? Is it work? Is it life? I can tell you one thing. My key to happiness didn't happen until I was able to slowly turn both those other burners back up, right? And be able to put time into friendships, put time into health, feel more in rhythm with my own life or more in balance, like you might want to call it, right? And I think that if anything, happiness is, nobody ever said that easiness or ease was happiness. That's not, that's not real. That's, those, those words don't necessarily correlate. For me, going through something challenging and understanding or unlocking a new space within my mind or my heart or my emotion, that's happiness, right? And I think that the real difference here is you, you want to live life not just exist that's the difference between I think passion right and, and and actually having it is like living life and not just existing not just taking up space but actually living and that's that's a painful process we die we all end somewhere right and we all kind of have an expiration date and I think that's kind of the point of life is that you, you live and you use as much of this thing as you're given as much of this experience as you're given, not just to exist to satisfy somebody else's needs or satisfy some business or whatever it is. And so I just hope people realize that risk, the fear of the unknown, these are critical parts of making a happy life. And I think that the more that we lean into those and we explore them and we peek around the corner at what's there and we just expose ourselves to scary situations, I think the more satisfied we'll be.